morning, good evening. I'm not quite sure where you are or where you're tuning in from, but you are very welcome all the same. Uh, welcome to all of you members of the extended Halo family. My name is Matt, Matt Beadle, and I have the, the honor, the privilege, whatever, call it what you will, to be, I believe, your last speaker today, certainly in this track. Uh, and I'm really honored to be here, genuinely grateful to be here. Wherever you are, relax, sit back for about 30 minutes or so. I'm going to talk for about 20 of those, hopefully. And what I would love if, is if I could respond to some of your questions. If I do this in a room full of people, I try and make it as interactive as possible. We're in a virtual room, so let's try and make it as, virtual, as interactive as possible. Max and I, the colleagues have been doing a brilliant job of that today. Uh, so I'll talk for about 20 minutes, and then if you've got some questions, shoot them as the presentation is going along into the chat function and then Max will come and join me on stage for the last 10 minutes or so and uh, I'll endeavor to answer as many questions uh, as possible and as a little carrot okay I'd like to dangle the two coolest questions that I hear today I'll send you personally a signed copy of one of each of my last two books okay so that would be uh, a great pleasure for me to do that so get those questions coming in so who am I my name is Matt, Matt Beadle. I was born in Great Britain. Um, I live and work in mainland Europe predominantly now. I've been a management trainer and facilitator and speaker uh, for about 12 years now. Before that, I ran a series of my own companies. I sold my last company in 2016. And since then, I've been lucky enough to spend my time traveling around the world, uh, certainly before the pandemic delivering workshops, talks, uh, training programs, facilitated um, uh, discussions, predominantly with leaders to try and help them reflect on their own situation, what they're doing, maybe get a little bit more performance uh, and uh, positivity in their, in their system, all right? What I specifically have been focusing on the last eight years or so is the subject of strengths orientation. And that's what I'd like to spend about 20 minutes talking to you about today. Okay. Um, in fact, I'm going to go back two slides to this very first question, uh, which some of you might have seen in the invitation or you might have seen today and you might have thought, what the heck is that about? So the key question that I wanted to ask today is, uh, do you want to go through life like a fly or a bee? So you may be thinking, hopefully you're thinking, what is all that about? The first question open to you is, what do bees search for? So as we've done before, check out in the bottom below the screen here, you should say, see um, an opportunity to go into the word cloud. Go into the word cloud, and I would love one, two, three words, however many you want to use. Describe to me what bees search for. It's not a trick question. I'd just love to hear your uh, vocabulary on how you would describe what bees search for. All right. I see that we have one person has commented. That is honey, flowers, beautiful nectar, rich flowers. Very nice. Have we got any more? Stick them in the, uh, in the word cloud. Flowers, the word is fatter or bigger, so I guess that means more people have, have said it. Energy, I like. Good contribution. Very nice. Beautiful. And I like the way that you've described it. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I ask this question a lot. Pollen, absolutely right. I ask this question of groups a lot. And almost always, at least somebody answers to the question, what do bees search for? They answer with honey. They don't search for honey. They make honey, which is absolutely amazing. We just need to take a moment to realize how amazing that is. You know, no other insects make marmalade or something, do they? But bees don't make honey. Sorry, they make honey, they search for pollen, nectar, and they find that where? As you've rightly put here in the word cloud, they find it in the beautiful, growing, developing, amazing, colorful, diverse, rich, exciting flowers of the world. And they're not finished when they've done that. They land in them, literally rub this glorious stuff all over their bodies, fly over to the next uh, flower and spread the joy around. They are absolutely amazing. They search for the developing and the joyous and then they spread it around. They literally encourage growth and it's wonderful. And what do flies search for? No need to put anything in the, uh, in the word cloud. I'll give you the answer. Shit. Right? I don't even know if I'm allowed to use that word here. Let's be honest, they, they search for crap. They search for the rotting, decaying, bacteria-ridden ridden filth. And they're not happy when they've just found it. They land in it, they rub it all over themselves, fly over there and spread the shit around. 
And I suppose my question to you is, what kind of mentality would you like to have? What kind of, what kind of insect would you like to be? Would you like to follow the bees and try and spread a little bit of joy around? Find the color, find the diverse, find the developing, find the exciting, spread that around a bit? Or do you want to go through life like a fly? You know, a colleague of mine says, what kind of glasses do you see the world through? Do you put your bee glasses on in the morning or do you put your fly glasses on in the morning? You know, you're the boss, you come into work. Oh, I've got my fly glasses on today. You were late, too many spelling mistakes in your report, didn't like the presentation, all of your work's bad, I'm off. What kind, how do the rest of the people in the office feel now? Honestly, hand on heart, how are they going to act? They're going to be flies to each other, aren't they? Listen, it might sound like a kind of a childish metaphor or a childish way to look at this, but this is exactly how human beings work. And it's very easy to create a mindset, very easy to create an atmosphere or a culture where we're all kind of poking each other and stabbing each other and scratching each other. So my question to you is, what can, our be, what can be our contribution, particularly as leaders, but also as team members, towards having more bee glasses on? All right? So there was, a, there was um, a story I'd like to share with you. It's the 1950s, it's after the Second World War. Uh, the American Air Force have noticed that some of their uh, pilots are starting to struggle and the numbers of crashes are going up. Okay, jet technology is developing and as the planes get faster, the number of accidents seem to be increasing as well. So there was a study conducted, of course. They need to, needed to find what the issue was here. And uh, they thought maybe it's pilot error. It turns out it wasn't. They trained the pilots very well. The pilots weren't the reason for the increased number of accidents. They thought maybe it's a technical error. They looked at the planes. The planes weren't the problem. The machinery wasn't the problem. And then one bright spark came up with the idea. Maybe it's the, the, the synergy between the pilot and the plane. Maybe the connection between the pilot and plane. Maybe that's the reason why there are so many crashes. And so they looked at the cockpits of the tradition of the standard US Air Force planes then in the 1950s and they realized something that a lot of people hadn't noticed is that they were using the same cockpit design as or cockpit shape certainly that they'd used 30 years previously the cockpits for the 1950s American planes were designed in 1922 and then somebody posited maybe the average American 1950s pilot has a different body shape from the 1920s pilot, and maybe they can't reach for the controls as well as the 1920s pilots could, and maybe that's the reason why the accident numbers are going up. So what did they do? They uh, did some research and tried to find out what the average American pilot looks like. They measured the body shapes of 4,063 American pilots leg length, height, width, girth, hand size, whatever, okay? And then they designed a cockpit that fit that average American pilot. Sounds like a good plan, right? You can't answer this, unfortunately, because you're out there in internet land. But rhetorical question, how many of those 4,063 pilots do you think had the same body shape as uh, the average American pilot? None of them did. In other words, they designed a cockpit to try and fit the average, to try and help as many people as possible, and they ended up by helping nobody. There is no such thing as average with regards to human beings. I'll say that twice because that is so important. There is no such thing as average. And if we treat our members of staff as average, if we create environments and systems for them uh, that are generic and a one-size-fits-all kind of way, you end up helping nobody. It would have been better if the American Air Force had built, what, measured one guy, built a cockpit just for him, at least then it would have fit one person. But it fit nobody. Just for fun, uh, this is Norma in the 1970s in, uh, in Italy. They did a similar study and they wanted to find what the average Italian woman's body shape was. They measured 3,864 women and you guessed it, none of them had the same body shape as Norma. And it's not even close. We're not even getting close to average because in the eight categories that they measured uh, of the body to try and develop Norma, only 40 of the nearly 4,000 women had the same body shape as Norma in even five categories. So we're not getting anywhere close to average. 
So if we want to talk about employee engagement, we've got to have a positive mindset and we've got to try and create systems that are individualized. And how do we do that? We do that by recognizing people's individual specific talents. So I got a friend of mine to draw this picture. I think he's done an absolutely beautiful job. The gentleman says to the animals here, so that it's fair, you all get the same task. Climb the tree. That's, that's, that's not fair, that's ridiculous. The monkey's already in the tree, the bird's flying above the tree going, this is a stupid game. The fish is like, I've got no chance. You know, the elephant's destroyed the tree. It's not, that's not fair. And we know it's not fair. We see that immediately. We see that some of these animals have a natural proclivity that allows them to solve this task very easily. Yeah, the monkey literally has four limbs and a tail. I mean, it's just such an easy task for him. The seal, though, oh, 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 it's got no chance of climbing the tree. So we see this. In other words, we notice physical proclivities, but I would argue that we are mercilessly neglecting and underestimating cognitive diversity. Let's say, let's say this is 40,000 years ago and all of this is just marshland. We're here in ha Hamburg, uh, Germany at the moment in a kind of a, an urban area. 40,000 years ago, this is all trees and bushes and marshes, right? I and the rest of the crew here, we're a tribe of sort of North German prehistoric creatures. We're wandering the marshland. What are we looking for? We're looking for sustenance, right? We're looking uh, to, to make sure that we can live another day and maybe procreate and maybe look after our children. What would we have done? Honest question, and I'm not, I'm not staging this because we are here today because our prehistoric uh, brothers and sisters solved those problems. They delegated. Even without language, they will have delegated. They, they had to because one person couldn't possibly have done all of the things in the tribe. So one person would have been sent out to get berries and one person would have been sent out to catch, I don't know, animals and, and maybe another person would have been charged with cooking those animals and another person looks after the babies. You get the idea, right? Hand on heart, honest question. And I don't want this to sound in any way, um, I don't know, body shaming or any of those new uh, phrases that we use to talk about people's physique. Which of, those, which of this tribe members in those days would have got the job of picking the berries? I would argue that nine times out of 10, it would have been the taller people. Not because they're better, but because they have a natural proclivity that makes it easy for, easier for them to pick fruit. Yes, somebody who is not as tall could do it, but they might have to jump to reach the same berries that a taller person could reach. Maybe they climb on a rock or they build some kind of primitive ladder or something. All possible, and they could achieve success, but they would have to invest energy to achieve the same achievement that the taller person naturally and very easily can achieve. Not saying that taller people are better here by any stretch, right? Uh, maybe we find that other people in the tribe have got fast twitch fibers in their legs. They'd be the people chasing after the animals, right? Uh, and the people with the softer hands would be the people for caring for their babies. You get the idea. And I think that we're very, very good at this. We're very good at watching natural physical proclivities. And I think we will genuinely change the working world if we become better at recognizing cognitive difference and cognitive proclivities. So we'll just have a little bit of fun. Raise your hands. You can't raise your hands, but a little voting thing is going to come up, OK? Uh, go ahead and vote for any of these if they, uh, if they fit to you. Raise your hand or click on the thing or you know, add to the a bar chart if you're the kind of person who talks to strangers in a lift. Or do you uh, have to tidy your house or your apartment before you can relax? I know that my wife certainly does. Uh, are you accused sometimes of being too nice? Are you accused sometimes of not being nice enough? I know some people like that. Do you have to hang your shirts up in your wardrobe according to their color? I certainly know somebody who does that. The cameraman laughed at that. Uh, do you make lists? I think a lot of us do that. Do you make lists at the weekend? Really? Saturday mornings, must uh, take the rubbish out, must do the gardening, I don't know. Uh, are you the kind of person, in fact, that's not on this list, but I've met a lot of people who, while they're writing, while they're looking at their to-do list, they think, oh, I've done something else. And they write it on the to-do list and then cross it out just to give them the, the, themselves a little buzz and a little boost, right? Uh, are lists important to you? How many questions do you ask? Are you kind of a question asker who likes to know what's going on a lot? Are you on the go a lot? 
Are you the kind of person that presses the lift button to remind the lift that you want to go? Come on, lift. All right, we've got some answers coming in here. People, 36% of you talk to people's in, people in lifts. I find that very charming. 20% of you uh, get the feedback that you're too nice. 12% of you get the feedback that you hang your clothes according to color. Okay, I don't want to be discriminatory, but you guys need help. No, I'm joking, of course. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Um, listen, I'm not even going to bother showing the next slide because it was just for fun. But the overall question is, why are they not all the same? Why did you not all raise your digital hand for all of them. You didn't do it because you have different natural proclivities. You have different natural cognitive talents. You have different ways of focusing the world and filtering the world. And different things are normal cognitively to you. Just like the fruit picking for the tall chap is more normal than for the, the person who's not so tall. And we've got, to, we've got to exploit this. We've got to get excited by this because this is called the jaggedness principle, right? This is a, a, a programmed um, part of nature. Whether, whether you believe in evolution or uh, uh, natural selection or God or whatever you believe in, it doesn't really matter. Fact is, we are here and we've been here for about 2.6 million years. I had the, the privilege uh, a few years ago um, for an international client to deliver some workshops in South Africa near Johannesburg. And I went to the uh, Sturkfontein um, Caves, which is about a, um, two hours north of, um, north of uh, 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 Johannesburg. And they, uh, we believe that that's uh, the, the site where they found the skull of the oldest humanoid, I will say, 2.6 million years. They've called that character Mrs. Pless, right? It's a phenomenal place and quite extraordinary. We've, as a race or as a series of races, a series of species, we have had 2.6 million years of opportunity to adapt and get better at stuff. And nature or God or whatever, call it what you will, some power has allowed us over that time to adapt to the problems around us. And this is called the jaggedness principle. Nature has literally made us jagged. It hasn't literally made us jagged. Lit uh, nature has made us jagged just as a knife is jagged so that it can cut through bread. So we are jagged so that we can cut through the myriad problems that the world sends us physical and mental. So we are deliberately different and we are deliberately special. And yet, what do we do? We create systems at work where we expect people to be jacks of all trade. We expect everyone at work these days, if you have a white collar traditional office job, we expect everybody to be good at giving presentations. Everybody has to be good at chairing meetings. Everyone has to be good at taking part in meetings. Everyone has to be good at writing reports, reviewing reports, uh, defending, pitching, uh, advertising, selling, upselling, downselling, recruiting. Everybody has to be good at everything. Why? Because nature certainly didn't make you like that. It didn't make you physically like that, and it didn't make you cognitively like that. We are deliberately jagged so that we can cut through different problems in life. The problem is, it's not only um, scientific and biological, um, unfortunately, it's also cultural. We're creating systems, particularly educational systems, that aren't helping us here. Let's go back to school for a little bit. Yeah, if I were to ask you the question, what do you notice here? What's the first thing that jumps out at you? A lot of people say that three and, uh, nine plus three isn't 11. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Sorry, that's a mistake. Apologies for that. What else do you notice about this picture? Five are right. I've shown this picture to thousands of people around the world, and eight times out of 10, people in the room will say, oh, nine plus three isn't 11, it's 12. We have become brilliant, not only biologically, but also socially, at finding weakness and honing in on that weakness and that negativity. I'd like to ask you what things would look like if we just spent a couple of moments of our time focusing on positivity. Five are right here. So let's say that this was uh, Johnny's uh, uh, maths uh, results at school, and this is his report card. 
I, 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 would, I grew up in Britain where an A is the best grade you can get, F is the worst grade that you can get. I know different systems have, uh, different education systems have different grade ideas, but you get the concept. So let's look at Johnny's report card. He's got a C in English, not bad. He's got an oh, A plus in geography, A in history, oh, F in maths. And just so that we don't miss it, the teacher has taken a nice red pen and written must try harder next to it and a sad uh, face just to hone in on the negativity, right? And I'm joking, this is not in fact Johnny's report card. This was my report card at school. Hand on heart, honest question, honest answer. What do most parents or guardians, when their child comes home with this report card, where would they put their focus? What would they talk to the child about? I'd argue that most of them would talk about the maths grade. Uh, listen, Johnny, we've got to do something about maths, right? You know, um, maybe I could spend time myself helping you with your homework. So the parent invests time. Maybe we could have a meeting with the teacher or the, or the head teacher. Yeah, maybe we could buy some, I don't know, some games or some books or some, uh, you know, some apparatus at home so to, so you could practice your um, maths. Oh, maybe we could send you to extra maths classes. Uh, there's a whole industry of that in, in, in Europe of students teaching, uh, you know, school pupils after, after school's classes. Um, in other words, we spend no little time, energy, love and money focusing on the weaknesses. Now, at this stage, I often get pushed back. Yeah, but you have to pass maths. Otherwise, you can't go to the next grade. Yes, you do. Pass maths. Go to those extra classes. Have a little bit of extra work. I don't know. Speak to the teacher about it. Work hard. But hand on heart, how many people who come home with an F on their grade uh, from school at maths, if the grade, by the way, is because um, they don't have a natural talent for maths, not because they have a problem with their teacher? How many people come back um, and, and improve that F to an A? Doesn't happen. I'll tell you what else doesn't happen. Who sends their parent, their kids, when they come home with this report card, which parents send their kids to geography classes? We don't do it, do we? We see it in black and white on the report cards. Really, we should be sending Johnny to extra geography classes because he clearly has a natural talent for this. He could go on to become, I don't know, to solve the tsunami problem or the plate tectonic, tectonic plate problem or whatever. He clearly has a talent for this, and yet we don't push that. We say, well done, Johnny. Uh, now focus on maths. And if you're not good at it, you're not going to get a PlayStation. Or if, you get, you, if your grade gets slightly better, you can go to tennis classes. Focus on the weakness. Focus on the weakness. Focus on the weakness. What would it be like if we focused on people's talents just for a change? This is uh, Don Clifton. Um, he's the godfather of strengths orientation. He's written a ton of books on this subject. One of the first researchers in this subject about 50 years ago in America that's become a huge movement of strengths orientation. And he said, a leader needs to know her strengths like a carpenter knows his tools. And it's true. You take a hammer for every job, you're going to smash a load of tables, right? And a carpenter knows exactly which tool you need to solve which problem. And we need to know what our cognitive talents are so that we can be be put in the, or we can be working on the right tasks and we can get the right people doing the right things. So you might be there saying, you know what, Matt, a lot of this is fun. You got a nice bee here. You got a fly. It's kind of a fun presentation, kind of interesting, thought provoking maybe. Yeah. Okay. But I want a bit of science. I'll give you a bit of science. Okay. Two minutes and then I'll stop and we'll do some questions. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, go to Google Scholar or your academic search engine of choice and type in strengths orientation or uh, talent orientation, something like that. You will get hundreds of studies that have proved the efficacy of strengths orientation. But here's one. This was Glock. Glock was interested in whether he can increase people's uh, reading speed. So he found that people read around 90 words per minute, averagely. He sent those people on a training course. After the training course, they got better, and they could read 150 words a minute. Not bad. Everyone's patting themselves on the shoulder saying, hey, training works. We got that, those people, those average people, from 90 words a minute to 150 words a minute. But Glock also found that there were some people who were just naturally talented at reading fast. They had no training in it. They just found it easy to read fast. Those people can read 350 words per minute before any training. That's about one side of A4. They, Glock sent those people on the same training course that the 90 group had been on. And after the training course, they could read 2,900 words a minute. 
superhuman achievements. The world record, by the way, for speed reading stands at about 10,000 words a minute, okay? Um, now, my message here is not the speed reading is important. My message here is, if you want to improve, people send them to training. If you want best-in-class performance, you've got to start with talent. And if you want to start with that talent, you've got to recognize talent. Another massive study was done in 2016 by Aspland et al. They um, looked, let me go to that slide here. They looked at a huge meta study, 1.2 million people, over nearly 50,000 departments over 45 different countries, looking at teams and groups of organizations who went through strengths-based uh, measures. They had strengths coaching or strengths co uh, training or they had uh, talent assessments or whatever. And they found increases in customer engagement, increases in employee engagement, increases in profit, and increases in sales. Who knew? Being nice to each other and getting people doing the things that they are good at makes more money. And they found decreases, and I think this is very interesting, very interesting in safety incidents. Strengths orientation just works. Positive mindset and getting people doing the right things that they're good at just works. People are happier, people are healthier, people perform better, and who knew, we make more cash. It just works. And you know what? It's nothing new because people knew two and a half thousand years ago, you choose a profession you love, you won't have to work a day in your life. That's Confucius. Thank you very much. I could go on all day, as I think you probably have uh, got the gist, but I'll stop there to give us a couple of minutes to answer some questions. Please do stay in touch. Here's my, uh, here are my contact details. I'd love to hear your stories about strengths. But if Max is there, maybe he'd like to come in and field some questions, if there are some. Well, indeed. Thank you very much, Matt, for the energy that you always bring. Thank uh, you, sir. That's marvellous. So thank you very much indeed. And I feel it a little bit... Lost behind these little fellas. They're good, aren't they? Let's get rid of the fly. We don't want to have fly glasses. Okay. There we go. Get rid of the sh Anyway, okay, so. So the coolest questions get a book, right? Right. Keep the questions coming in. Uh, we've got three minutes before we're going to cut to the next section. So um, we've got one question here at the moment. Keep them coming. Um, how do we know if our behavior is naturally, naturally normal or something that we picked up during our lives? Absolutely brilliant question. There are genuinely assessments. There are tools that we can use to help recognize and reflect on our uh, personal cognitive talents. So I'm not plugging any tools here, okay? I'll mention a couple, but there are many on the market. The market leader is probably uh, the Strengths Finder tool from the company Gallup. High Five is another very interesting one. There are others. If you're interested, send me an email or contact me and I'll get you in touch with them. These are um, normally ipsative questionnaires where you answer some questions and then the system spits out your talent profile. And then you use the text and the videos and the information to kind of reflect on that and dig deeper because the vast majority, and I will, I will, uh, I will certainly um, put the cat amongst the pigeons here, but the majority of your talents are naturally um, occurring. We do pick things up through uh, culture. So the nature nurture debate has been rumbling on for about 150 years. At the moment, Stan, 2022, the ma vast majority of the research shows us that uh, nature is winning on that. Okay, so you believe that the results of such tools like StrengthsFinder are an insight into who we are, let's say, intrinsically as opposed to learnt? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't even call it belief. I mean, there's a strong scientific um, tomb that's, that, that certainly supports that, but they're only a starting point for self-reflection. They're not, the, they're not you. They're not your character. A colleague of mine really puts it really nicely. He says, it's not the street, it's just the roadmap. Okay, so I might... I may know where the church is from the, from the map, but I can choose to go under the bridge or over the river, right? That's my call. So these tools are interesting and they help you to reflect on your proclivities and your talents a little bit, but you know, you're the master of your own destiny. Oh, we've got a couple more questions that have come in. So probably time for one more right now. Um, what would you tell a company that claims everyone is a talent and everyone is a leader? I would agree with the first part and I would disagree with the second part. Say more. Everyone definitely has talents, and that's not sort of speaker, guru, oh, you're all wonderful, um, kind of nonsense. That is just a scientific fact, okay? We all solve cognitive problems in different ways. And if you can find a particular problem that she can solve best because she's got that cognitive makeup, then she's the right person. Call it a talent. Call it a strength. Call it fun. Call it anything you want. But some people can achieve high performance easier with less energy than others. That's a scientific fact. But is everyone a leader? No. Does everyone have to be a leader? I don't believe that they do. Okay. 
Super. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. That's all we have time for for now. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you to all of you. All the very best.